finally I, I snapped and was like, listen, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're a f crook, this, that, and the other thing. It's the one time I've done this in my whole career. And it was a major mistake. I was like, this, we're done here. I just, I just, I marched down to my car and he's yelling at me. What up on the road? He's yelling. And it's like, oh, ha, there he goes. Little man. It just, I was like, jumped in my car and just drove away as fast as I could. want to start with, you know, tell us a little bit about Chris Stanley, kind of what you got going on, who you are, what your business is all about and, and what you're doing to serve the industry. All right, Matt. Well, thanks for having me uh, back on Adjuster TV. I can't believe you're letting me back this year in 2021. After the disaster of 2020, I thought for sure you're going to blame me personally for the disaster last year of being on Adjuster TV that somehow there was some symbolic uh, link there, but uh, you're letting me back. So I appreciate it. Get a second chance of redemption. Yeah. <laughs> No problem, man. Yeah, it's, uh, you know, I, I, uh, forgiveness is an important uh, trait for a person to have. So just, yeah. don't screw uh, it. just don't screw up 2021 and we'll be all right. All right. Well, for uh, those who uh, haven't watched the other videos or don't know who I am, uh, my name is Chris Stanley. And basically, I've had a career as an adjuster very different than what Matt did. Matt was a property adjuster for forever and um, I was auto. And so I had a very different path. And so I started a company about nine years into my career, uh, just to help people learn how to get started in this industry differently than what the rest of the internet was talking about, which was catastrophic property. But that there was actually a lot of different things you could do, including auto, and just trying to help inform people about that. So that's what I do through a company called iPath. And we just want to help people learn how to get started in this industry. I, I don't know that we we could really put all the effort that we do into Adjuster TV and IA Path if we weren't trying to help. I mean, what would be the point otherwise? Right. There, there'd be no point. Um, but, you know, at the end of the day, um, the traditional training model says this is great, training people, teaching people how to get started but ultimately people were still kind of left to flounder on their own. And it was like, we had to put a little bit more effort into it as I path uh, as a company to say, we can't just train people and send them on their way because they're going to get burnt out in six months, a year, they're going to fall on their face. And so we've got to provide a second level of defense for that. And so we do what we call mentorship. We really just go beyond classes and say, okay, let's continually support these adjusters. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. And I, I think that, you know, when, when you and I, I mean, we talk quite frequently um, kind of about our businesses and, and, and what we're going to try to do to sort of help the industry. And I think it, it, it goes beyond just having a boot camp or just having selling a book or selling a this or that or the other thing in order to truly serve this industry, because it's not like, because each individual adjuster is like their own business their own like kind of a business right. person or their, their own like LLC or their, you know, they're, they're, they basically have to run their career as though it's a business with, with marketing. Even if you're getting sales. employed as a W2 through a major IA firm, yeah. you still got to navigate who am I getting contracted by? Who am I going to work with? Who am I not? What camps am I going to attend? What, what orientations? And it's like all decisions way more complicated than just saying, I want to be an adjuster, Matt. You know, it's just, Stressful. Yeah. I got my license. I got Xactimate level two certified. I'm ready to go. You know, there's, that's like, you just basically got the, the first two, you know, the, the ticket into the game. And then you got to like learn the rest of the, the whole thing. Hey, you learn how to play um, before you go up against Peyton Manning or Tom Brady. You see how right. old I am. <laughs> yeah, exactly, and I get right. smoked right on the field. So now you got to learn how to play. And that's really what we, we try to help people with. And you too, it's like, how do you help people with so many facets of their business that they have to learn? Yeah. It's, it's, it's not just one. It's not just exact, mate. It's not just CCC yeah. one. It's the whole gamut of the mentality of being an adjuster. It's, it's, it's up for grabs and for everyone's interpretation. And, and me and you both, I think we're just trying to give people handles. Like, come on, here's something to grab onto. Here's another right, thing. Right. Don't fall off the boat. <laughs> Well, and the, the thing is, is there's, there's so many different boats to get on, right? I mean, there's, there's so many different ways that you can, you can run your career as an adjuster. And so what we try to do is, and I know what you try to do is to 
provide like a, an, a basic roadmap that will get them to where they can kind of see, get, get the lay of the land and then, and then be able to make decisions from there where to go. But they got to be able, there's a, a, several hills you have to climb in order to get there, right? You have, have to, you have to, to get training, you got to get licensing, you have to understand claims workflow, which you don't get with a lot of training. You know, Xactimate level two certification is not going to teach you how to, to do a claim. It's going to teach you how to find stuff in Xactimate <laughs> and how to use Sketch. It's not- Which is good and useful, happens. but it's- You need to know that. But it's not- But you, Yeah, but it's not the be all end all. Yeah, but so if you don't know how to do, how to like do a claims workflow, how to, how to scope a building in the right order or a vehicle, you're going to be lost and it doesn't matter how, you know, how many Disney princess castles you can build and sketch. <laughs> you're just, you're going to, you have a high risk of, of washing out. And, and we see it all the time with, on, with adjusters with their, on their first events, they, they, they get the little like, kind of handpicked training things that, you know, they pick up from social media and they don't have any guidance. They don't have a mentor to tell them these, this is the roadmap. This is the path you have to go down. Um, and so that's what, you know, I know that that's what you're trying to provide. Um, and I think you're doing a great job of it. I mean, you've been doing this longer than I have. So as far as like, you know, having a little business like this. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, with the roadmaps, and I know, you know, we've, we've partnered together on one to do the property one. Um, the roadmaps really are just like the framework, right? Like I, when I'm talking with people yeah. on the phone, they're like, I did it out of order, Chris. I, I got my license and then I did this and, and I did number seven at third and oh, am I ruined? And I'm like, no, that's just learning how to play the game of chess. I don't care which piece you learn how to play with first. You just got to understand the rules of the game and then kind of put it together a cohesive strategy. A lot of people are, you know, get frustrated at first when they're like, I did it backwards. It's like, I backwards. You just did it different than what laid out. We're just trying to lay it all out there for you and let you kind of decide what do I want my life to look like? If that's what I got to do, is that the route I want to go? Yeah. So like I, when I, when I teach people, I, I'm telling them, I'm saying, listen, this is like the way I'm going to show you right now is kind of the essential workflow. Take this as a foundation, use it on your first, like either, you know, most likely going to be a cat property deployment. Use this method so that you can survive that first deployment so that you can, you know, it, it shortens the learning curve. It, it helps the people, helps people kind of understand what I have to do next and what I need, you know, what, what things I need to prioritize, how to get everything done and, and all in the time that you have and to be able to learn at the same time. You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. And then I tell them, I say, listen, take take that on your next deployment or the you know deployment after that and make your own thing. You know, you, you've learned the steps, you've learned the basics, you've gotten into the game, you're, you got points on the board. Now take it and build from there. Like use that as a foundation to, to build from, because we can't take them. You can only take them so far, right? I mean, it's, there's, we can hold their hand up to a certain point and give them everything that they need and to a certain point. And then beyond that, it's like, well, it's, it's up to you to take it from there. Um, so you know, I think we've got a vested interest in this industry um, for high quality adjusters, people who who get it, people that it clicks with. Um, but there's there are a lot of opportunities. I mean, insurance. I mean, it's 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 an industry that's not getting smaller. It's not affected very much by I don't think by the economy. Some probably, but not like as much as something else, because people have to have insurance. You have to insure your car. You have to insure your house. You know, you have to have health insurance. Um, 
So let's talk a little bit about um, what kind of opportunities there are out there besides, you know, auto, just like, oh, the guy got in a car accident or he got hail damage on his car. What else do you see out there as far as opportunities for adjusters or for, for claims professionals? Well, to set the stage, right, you know, I think most people know cat property, right? If they're watching Adjuster TV, dear Lord, they better understand cat property opportunities. <laughs> What's going on there, right? So I don't have to explain that at all. You also have the same thing on the auto side. You have the, the, the cat auto where, yeah, lots of hail falls in Denver, dealerships, insureds, rush hour traffic all gets hammered and everybody's got tens of thousands of claims the different carriers do. And then they send adjusters out for a few weeks to take care of it. Great. That's another type of opportunity. And then kind of what you're alluding to and in, in what we, um, we kind of our bread and butter at iPath is helping people get break into the industry just by getting daily claims, the collision claims. So, you know, on the way home from work, rear ended in, in a back to back, you know, bumper to bumper traffic and somebody needs to go look at that damage. And then it's like, okay, well, that's great. You've kind of got your career started, uh, you know, under that sneaking into the industry kind of path. Like, hey, I'm getting claims and it didn't take a year. It didn't take six months. You know, there's wrecks happening every day. But then a lot of people kind of feel frustrated if they, they think that's it, be all the end all. Like a lot of people think cat properties it or, or daily auto. Well, what do I do now? It's like, am I at the end? Is that the finish line? And it's like, oh, no, with insurance, like you're saying, is huge. It's massive there's so much opportunities so what we try to teach people is okay this is like you said get your points on the board get working in this industry earn trust no like and trust in any business is huge so if people know you they like your work product and then they trust you to close a claim that's not just gonna be for cat auto or cat property or daily auto there's all sorts of other claims out there like auto liability um a lot of us field people the thought of sitting at home or on a cubicle in a cubicle for, you know, some big carrier handling claims may be like pulling teeth, you know, just like this sounds terrible, but there is a lot of opportunities around the desk handling of claims. And so in the independent space, there's almost this untapped side of the industry that nobody really intentionally goes after. It's kind of like, it's like the rebound play. Like I didn't get that cat property deployment but the best offered me a, a liability deployment. No, nothing about liability, but here I go, right? And it seems to be by accident we fall into it. But the reality is there's a whole yeah. side of the industry that we as independents especially tend to ignore, whether it's liability, workers' comp, bodily injury, um, you know, even the virtual assist stuff. Some people kind of get what that is, and they're like, yeah, sure, I'll take anything, right? But then they get into it, they're like, I didn't know this is a whole thing. There's this whole huge office here of people assisting with claims. Um, and I think that more people would succeed if they didn't just look at the little skinny pathway, like only 200 new adjusters are going to make the cat property deployments this year or whatever, or I hope you're one of them, right? It's like, well, wait, look outside <laughs> the box here. So – those are some of them, but even heavy equipment claims, there's marine, there's crop. You know, if you ever figure out how to get into crop, please let me know. Uh, there's tons of people who want to learn how to do crop. Uh, but there's all these things that if you intentionally go after, you'll break in because nobody's intentionally going after them. And so right. I think that for most people, auto, property, sure, that's a great start. But you really got to think about what do I want to do in this industry? Is being an independent right for me? And I've been, am I an entrepreneur at heart? Do I like the risk and the reward, the stress of working seven to seven, at least seven days a week for an indefinite number of time without seeing my family? Or are you more a nine to five kind of person? And there's nothing wrong with that. There's lots of opportunities, wow. even on the traditional insurance side. So I just think if you think about insurance as a whole, that there's no reason just because you fail at one shot that you don't keep shooting, that you just throw the jersey down and walk away. I failed at being an adjuster. It's like, what? You spent all this money, time, effort, energy, uh, getting your license, getting training. You're valuable to somebody somewhere. You just got to start looking around. You got to start searching out for this. Yeah. Yeah. Big time. I mean, it's, it's, uh, 
you know, I, I think for for property adjusters, the traditional way, you know, to become unless you unless you're coming from a carrier and you've already got like carrier training and all that kind of stuff and experience, most property adjusters are probably independent adjusters are going to get their start on a CAT deployment of some kind. No, right. I did. Most people I know did. If you're an auto claims adjuster or appraiser, you already know that SCA is one of the top companies that you can work for on the auto side. But if you're a property adjuster who's never done any auto, you may have never even heard of SCA. We've heard of them now. SCA Claim Services is launching their property division and they're poised to bring their decades of claims management experience and extensive resources to the property side of things. Insurance carriers already trust SCA because they know they will always receive a high level of customer service and policyholder satisfaction. And with literally millions of claims handled in SCA's four decade history, carriers trust SCA to help them avoid unnecessary costs by handling every claim, every time with unparalleled accuracy and a commitment to doing things the right way. I mean, these guys are old school, right? Since 1979, SCA has been exceeding expectations. Only a company dedicated to serving and taking care of people, including their adjusters, can a company like this continue to grow in this industry. Join the team with industry-leading NPS scores and cycle times that has the resources to bring new opportunities for not only auto adjusters, but now for property adjusters. To get started with SCA Claim Services, head on over to adjustertv.com slash SCA and while you're there, don't forget to download the totally free SCA Claim Services Field Adjuster Gear Guide. Again, that's adjustertv.com slash SCA to download the free gear guide and to apply. But but again, that's 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 kind of like the gateway, right? So new people coming in, they're getting their licenses, they're getting, you know, they're doing everything right. Maybe, you know, maybe they're following our 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 roadmap or you know, your roadmap. Um, and they're or they in their trying to follow it to the letter um, and then they miss storm season somehow like they don't get deployed somehow uh, maybe this just was a weak year right as far as storms goes which will can and, and absolutely does happen and <laughs> yeah there's no predicting there's no predicting it um you know there's always something going on i mean i worked for 20 years as a catastrophe adjuster and was always deploy, always able to deploy every summer even when other people on social media were complaining that there was no work there's something there's always some some little thing right but you're not going to get those something little something gigs as a brand new person so if there's a if there's you know 2020 was a historic year for hurricanes but it could just as easily be 2013 which was not great for hurricanes as far as i remember right or, or you know, like a, a handful of years ago, where we had Florence, was it Florence and Matt Dorian did the, you know, the 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 dog leg, the epic, and, epic, just about face and just go up the coast and like everybody and their mother was deployed to Florida before it hit, yeah, and then not a single claim basically came out of it. The number of times I've watched the weather, I've watched the Weather Channel and seen hurricanes do that is. It's like dozens of times that happens all the time. It'll come, you know, be a category 5.5 roaring towards the coast. And then two hours before landfall, it drops off to a tropical storm or depression. And then it just rains a little bit. That happens all the time. Right. So, you know, there are to kind of like, you know, piggyback on what you're saying. There are a lot of opportunities out there outside of cat that you can get into these days in particular with the technology that they've got the virtual the virtual assist stuff which you know if if if, if you don't know if the listener doesn't know that's that is where a, a somebody who's not necessarily a licensed adjuster will have take a smartphone or an ipad and be assigned losses where they just go and take photos or they'll take a walk around and take video of a property or a vehicle or whatever and they don't write an estimate. They don't do any, make any coverage decisions. They don't do any, you know, I don't talk to the contractor or really the insured other than to say, well, you know, your company will be in touch with you. That's a, that's a thing that's not going away. The carriers use it for a lot of different kinds of claims. I think auto is pretty heavy. It could be the stuff. homeowner or the, the vehicle owner as well. They're doing that. They're just having them right, right. Or throwing losses in a lot of cases. In a lot of cases they are. Um, but there's still plenty of opportunity for, for people, you know, through like we go look or on source. Um, I don't know. There's probably a ton, ton more. And I think most major IA firms and TPAs these days 
are doing some version of this where they have teams of scopers out there taking pictures of stuff and then they they upload their documentation their photos and maybe they wrote a little scope or whatever they send that up and then somebody's sitting on the computer either in like a, a call center but with covid you know i was talking to pace at their about home this. they just they're at home they're they could be home. anywhere in the country yeah or anywhere in the we could be on on, the, on a beach in mexico as long as you got the internet and writing claims and getting paid right so it's, it's, you know, but there's still opportunities for traditional adjusters out there where you you got to be licensed, you got to be experienced, you got to have training and you have to have um, knowledge of the policy so that you can discuss the claim with the, the homeowner well, and it's the like, contractor. And, and if you're going to choose between someone who doesn't have all that and someone who does have all that, even to do the virtual assist or the desk handling, you're going to pick the guy who understands what the heck's going on over someone who doesn't. So you right. have to think oh, yeah. For sure. as a business or like, I'm going to go with Tom Brady if Tom Brady is available or Matt Allen as a proper cap property adjuster, if he's available, but it's not until you get to the bench, do you traditionally see the newer people get their shot. But if you're trying to get your shot in all the positions across the board, it's a whole lot easier to earn a backup position, to just kind of sneak in and improve yourself. Um, I had perfect example of this whole, kind of about Facebook for adjusters about like following the path and then seeing an opportunity and jumping on it. And this is kind of what I recommend to most people is pick a direction you're going to go, cap property, auto, daily, whatever you're going for, right? Start heading that direction, but don't put blinders on and ignore all the other opportunities. We had 38 students in our auto mentorship class in the first quarter of this year. Crazy, ridiculous. But wow. then guess what happened? The winter storm in Dallas, right? And all of a sudden, everybody's been called for deployment. And, you know, I probably had five to seven students going, Chris, I got to take this. Are you going to be mad at me? I'm like, are you kidding me? Go, go, <laughs> right. go. This is the chance where you, you deviate from the roadmap. That was just your guide to get you moving. But then when an opportunity comes, you jump to that and just come back and finish up the auto stuff. Or vice versa, if you're going after property and you see that there's a place to go to auto or to desk instead of waiting, Take that opportunity because you got to earn a reputation of handling being a claims yeah. handler, as Matt puts it. Got to be a professional claims handler. You can do that in any of them because somebody with common sense and claims can work in almost anything. You can be trained the, the details of the job. Right, right. Yeah. So, so insurance policies, broadly speaking, across, you know, across any industry or any type of claim, are generally there's, there's some similarities between them, right? So you start to get to know the property policy, then it helps you, or the auto, vice versa, the auto policy versus, and there, there's there's differences definitely, and they're, they're different beasts for sure. But you start to learn the kind of the lingo and sort of like the 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 lexicon, I guess, of of insurance and understanding there's a lot of like, it's a contract, right? And it's, and it's written by yeah. attorneys and legislators and influenced by you know by statutory stuff by by cases, um, influences a lot of policy stuff. Um, but the more familiar you get with these different kinds of policies, the the more it starts you start to be able to see the matrix a little bit as far as you know understanding like oh well this makes perfect sense you know I've I've done residential property I can go do condo now right or I can go do liability now um, I have to learn the differences but I can still do it. Um, well, you also know the customer it, service aspect too. You have a confidence and a swagger when dealing with people that like, even yeah, if you yeah. don't know, you learn how to say, I don't know, but I'm going to find out. Or like, yeah, let me give exactly. you a call back and, and, and I'll give you the details to that. And you can go ask for help. When you're first starting, you're like paralyzed. Like I'm going to mess it up. There's a time bomb. If I clip the wrong yeah. wire, <laughs> I don't know what to do. And Green so wire, red there, wire, green wire, red wire. I don't yes, know. Exactly. So if you the get blue to a one. few, yeah, click the blue one. Where's the yellow one? I thought Matt said yellow. Um, <laughs> but if you can get through a few of those scenarios in any type of claim, you're just going to walk with a different walk into your next opportunity because you're going to realize the big secret is Matt and I don't know everything. Nobody <laughs> knows everything. And every time you get a claim, you're just 
trying to read the guidelines, trying to look at the policy, trying to be smart, <laughs> trying not to be dumb, not the same thing, <laughs> but in just right. working through the process and knowing when to ask for help. Um, so getting any steps in is a huge win. Um, and just look at everything as a stepping stone. Even if it's not your end destination, use auto, use liability, use desk adjusting virtual assist, even cap property to get where you ultimately want to be. Maybe that's daily autos and heavy equipment, but there's this huge winter storm in Dallas. Well, go make some money. Property yeah. can be the home run or it can be the strikeout, you, you know, but as long as you're willing to accept that, that can be the big thing for people each year is, hey, I know I'm going to get some shot in property every calendar year, but my staple is something else. That's totally fine. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With Scoper Writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster, but you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York, makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Mix and match, you don't have to just pigeonhole yourself as one thing no no for sure and i would say i especially for new folks to diversify right so in other words you handle a bunch of different kinds of claims because it's it's not really like well this one particular deployment or this one particular claim that's making the difference or that's moving the needle in your career it's how did you do over the course of the year were you busy more than you were not busy right were you able to you know in the downtime were you able to just click your phone on go to inspectors on demand and just start getting some files for a little bit and then turn it off. You get deployed on a, you know, hailstorm hits, turn off inspectors on demand and go do the hailstorm and then come home and jump on, turn it on. You know, I mean, it's like, this is what I used to do when I drove for Lyft and there's a company called Postmates that does delivery. I had to turn them on both at the same time. And whichever one sent me a job first, I was like, okay, I'm taking that pause the other one or, or decline the, you know, other, uh, jobs while I'm working this job and then you can kind of stack them or whatever. Anyway, so I would say for new folks to, to diversify, but, but I think, and you can tell me what you think about this, that there could be an argument for at the higher levels um, for somebody to, to specialize, right? To, so oh, to somebody totally. to become like a high end, large loss commercial, you know, adjuster, and that's all they do or they're like large loss or high end, higher end liability. Um, Okay. You know, is, yeah, is I got something, gonna... got something for this. Yeah, let's hear it. Yeah, okay, so what? a lot of what we've been talking about is that initial adjuster who's like, I'm just trying to get my hands in this industry to survive, right? And yeah. I think there's a big difference between being able to survive as an adjuster and being able to thrive. So you say yes all the time when it comes to surviving until you get to yes. survival in this industry, you say, yes, you say, yes, you say, yes. But the moment, and it's even in yours and I's business is the same thing with IAPAP and adjuster TV. We said yes to like everything that came our way for four ish years. And then all of a sudden it's like, I can't do everything anymore. As an adjuster, you can't do everything all the time. And you just get to that point where you're thriving in your family and your income and in your business, you have to then switch from, I'm surviving. Now I want to thrive. And now I have to be really good at saying no. I have to yeah. know what to say yes to. Otherwise, 
you'll miss your opportunities that are taking where you want to go. But it's a very big difference. At first, it's all yeses. You talk to James Mathis, he'll tell you, say yes, say yes, always say yes, don't ever say no. What is James Mathis doing now? He's saying no a whole lot, and he's being very particular about what he's yeah. doing. But for his first year, that's all he did was say yes. And then now he's kind of shifted to, no, I'm picking what I want to do and the life I kind of want. It's a now a lot of no's. So I think that's the yeah. difference so how do you- there. How do you decide? I mean, what do you, what makes you say, all right, well, I'm going to say yes to these and no to those. Well, first off, it's just your, your blood pressure. Number one. I mean, if your <laughs> bank account and your blood pressure are, are opposites, right? Your blood pressure is really high. Your bank account is really low. You probably be saying, need to be saying yes more to get the momentum going. Uh, but once you kind of find that, like I can breathe right now, and, and I have a chance to sit still and not say yes, determine, and I, I think you should do this before you ever start, that's something we're real big on at IAPATH, is determine what you want your life to look like long-term, not this month, not even this year, two to five years down the road. Why are you getting into adjusting? Because it's for a reason. If you're doing it just because you want to sit in a cubicle for a big insurance carrier, making 15 bucks an hour, Cool. That's great because you want a stable job. That's amazing. Go after that, right? But if it's I want freedom, um, I want to be financially independent, I want to be able to retire before I'm 65, whatever your reasons are, I just want to attend my daughter's ballet recital when she has it. Whatever your reasoning is, you need to know that. And then when you get to that survival point, you say – Okay, I'm surviving. I don't need to panic for every dollar. Now, no, I can't close claims on Saturday because I'm going to my daughter's ballet recital. Now I'm being picky because I got in, I'm established, I got some momentum. But ultimately, what you say yes to is determined by your vision and how you want to claim your life. If it's being on a sailboat like like I am, right, you're going to be saying yes to a lot of remote stuff once you get to be picky. You're going to be saying yes to doing things virtually and no to doing things in person. If you want to stay home with your family every week of the year, you need to be getting at the daily claims, whether it's auto or property, and start saying no to the cat, saying yes to the daily. But if it's traveling is your dream, you better be saying yes to the cat. So it's different for everybody. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I mean, I I love to travel and it, like every cat deployment was an adventure. Oh, it's a new place to go, a new place to try out the food and check out the whatever. Yeah, you're gonna new have food to... trucks. That's the important piece. Don't forget right. that. New food exactly. trucks. Um, so yeah. And I think, uh, you know, for me, it's, it's, it's kind of deciding, taking a look at like, where is the, the most the, of all the things that I enjoy doing of all the, 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 the tasks or the assignments or the kind of work that I like to do, you know, what are the ones that, that are really moving the needle on my why, right? And then like wh- what my goals are and my income and then throwing everything else out and just concentrating on that. And I think generally speaking, people will find that, you know, 20% of your efforts are really kind of contributing to about 80% of your your results, right? And the other big 80%, you know, sure, you're making some money off of those or whatever. But if you cut out the, all those away and you just focused on that 20%, then you could fill it up with 100% of, of the ones that really, really move the needle instead of, you know, the, the working for a firm that you don't click with personally, right? There's, there's, a, there's it's not like any, anything against anybody or any firm or whatever, but you can, right. you can find that you have a personality conflict with, with certain kinds of companies or this, you like this, this company culture a lot. And this one, you can, eh, I don't really care about that over there, but they give me work. Um, and they have a really, really, really like convoluted hard process. It's hard to get my files through file <laughs> so, review. Yeah. And the, the fee bills are pretty good, but there, it's a lot of work and it's a lot of stress. And I'm always up till 1130 at night working on those files. Whereas and then you actually do the math here, and you're, you're per hour. You're not making as much. Right, exactly, because you're working a whole lot longer, even though it seems like the fee bills are better. Um, but then you have this company over here where they have everybody's super laid back and super casual. And they always answer the phone when you call with a question and simple process doesn't, you know, maybe they pay like 70 or 80% of what this other company pays, 
but you can do a lot more claims and you're, you're watching Netflix at nine o'clock at night instead of like with your head buried in your laptop working on claims. Right. So that's the, those are the kinds of things I, for me, kind of helping make, make a decision on, on whether who I'm going to cut out and who I'm going to keep and sort of like the direction I want to go and how does that support um, again, like your long-term goals and your why, like, why am I doing this? What am I trying to, what, is, what do I want my life to look like? Let's, let's craft that and make all these things serve it. And, you know, this doesn't necessarily serve it. It serves it some, but not as much as this does. And we just want to get more of these, right? You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for? Like you're just a number on a roster. Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. And Paysetter is bringing training to a city near you. Check out their summer tour dates at adjustertv.com slash Paysetter. Well, the whole 80-20 thing, and talking about different IA firms you might not want to work for. Um, I got this question just yesterday, which is what firms, if you had to do it all over again, would you go work with and align yourself with? And I was like, one, I'm not answering this question. This is too crazy <laughs> of a question. Yeah, there are too many bear trap. curveballs here. Yeah, it is a bear trap for sure. And <laughs> I was like, hey, hey, but yeah, but, but two, and more importantly, I think you're looking at it wrong. You need to try to align yourself with as many people as possible. And so I wrote an email about it and sent it out to uh, the iPath newsletter list and said, guys, there, I think we need a mental shift here. This 80-20 rule is so important. You know, 20% of the efforts getting 80% of the results, you need to do more of that thing. But a lot of times we don't know what that is, like you're saying. We don't know what I firm we're going to align with. We don't know is it going to be the best. Eberl's pilot that we click with and that we can work from, who's going to give me my opportunity? And so I, I said, let's kind of shift this from who will hire me and who do I want to work for to I, you as an entrepreneur, you could go hire a sales team, a QC team, an HR team with nothing down by just getting on somebody's roster and say, go find me work, pilot. Go find me work, Eberl. Go find me work, Renfro. And then when you find work, give me a call. And then if you end up not enjoying the type of clients they go and find you, then you fire them and you don't take any more work from them. It's that's it, like, but you got to switch yeah, your mindset yeah. to, to using the IA firm as part of your business and say, yeah, they make a good chunk of the fee bill, but I don't have to deal with taking Liberty Mutual out to dinner. I don't have to deal with that. They just find me the work and call right. me when I get the 80% or 60% of the fee bill that gets us 80% of the result, which is our income up. And I think too often we squabble with IA firms and just say, no, 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 let's just get to get to working and then we can get picky. But I think, I think yeah, you're right on about for the sure. Yeah. And I, and, and just to kind of talk about the, the fee schedule split a little bit, I mean, people, I used to, I mean, you know, it's like, well, you, you know, it used to be 70 now it's 65 and now from there it's 60. And, but the thing about it is, is that you're exactly right. If you, if you look at it as, as though, you know, they're like a, kind of like a headhunter sort of for you to go get you work. They're an intermediary between you and the work, right? They have massive overhead. They've got buildings full of people making phone calls, taking phone calls, doing the administrative stuff on all this, on all this stuff. They're taking the CEO of Liberty Mutual out to, you know, fancy dinners and whatever, and trying to get them as a client. They're doing a lot of work that we don't have to do. We, we benefit from it as adjusters when they just start assigning us claims. That's that when we get those claims, that's, that's the result of a long period of 
like courting years. courtship between years can years be old. absolutely years. You know, I mean, it, it's, it's totally true. Um, and again, it, it, for me, especially the, at the beginning for newer adjusters, on, especially on a cat, it's volume, period. It, it, the split, you know, how good or bad the fee schedule is, those are considerations, but I don't think they're the, really the prime considerations. Again, it goes back to that company culture. Are you clicking with them? Is it is the is the workflow and the process that they have for you? Is is it is it easier to get the work done quickly and to serve the customers? Um, or is it a great big pain in the rear end, but you get paid, you think you're getting paid more? Um, so I like to look at that year and say, was I able to close 600, 800, 1,000 claims that year? Then great. You know, and my my total gross earnings are gonna reflect that, right? Um so the more, the more, the better. And, and if, if given the option on cat, if they say, all right, well, Matt, here's your, you can, you can choose, you can go into this little neighborhood with all these little teeny tiny post-war houses in it or houses built in the fifties and sixties, little 412 straight gable, 22 squares, 18 squares brick, uh, or you can go over to this neighborhood with $700,000 houses and, you know, 60 square roofs and everything. And they're going to be huge claims. I'm going to that little neighborhood every time because I can do 10 of those a day. And, if, you know, volume, I'm not volume. Make volume and it's, I'm going to be done with them by the end of the day. And I'm not going to be having to deal with because all the contractors are going to be over there in the rich neighborhoods and they're going to be fighting tooth and nail for every single job. Those 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 drag out, they cost extra money because you have to either spend extra time to diagram those buildings, which takes time because you have to walk around and get measurements, or you have to pay for Eagle View or Hover to get the measurements, which definitely cuts down on the time, but just, it's money coming out of your pocket that's eating into your, you know, your bottom line a little bit. It's trade-offs. You know, if I, if I have an expectation that I'm going to be on a storm for four months, which these days, I don't know if that's really a, a, so much a thing anymore from what I hear. Used to be, I get called on a hailstorm and they'd say, hey, Matt, when you go to Omaha? And I'm like, all right, well, I'm going to be there till October and it's May. I, and I'm there in October. And, you know, they're like, all right, well, it's kind of slowing down. Not for most anyways. Yeah. So I would make that decision based on that as well. Because I know that I can just like, you know, by the end of the summer, I've made all the money that I need. If there's a hurricane, great. If, if not, you know, and it's and speaking of hurricanes in 20 years, I worked six hurricanes, right? And that's and a couple of those were in one year Two actually two of those. So four, so two, one year and two, another year, right? So that's, and then so it was only four years in. total of hurricanes. So it was really, yeah. So twenty percent of your working career, you actually twenty percent of the years, one out of five. Exactly. And you know what? And the thing is, is that I think other adjusters may have worked more hurricanes over that same time period, but most of the time, I was deployed already on a hail event that I was just in all summer long, and I'm staying on that hail event because hail's a whole lot easier than hurricane claims. I can tell you that right now. And, yeah. And unless you unless you're on the coast. Or you're getting like Irma claims with the, with that whole thing. It's probably basically the same money. I mean, because it's just wind yeah. claims, right? Um, so, so I want to yeah. piggyback on your whole like, oh, I'd pick hail and stick with this, and and they de kept me deployed from mid October. Well, that's because you had a good work product, you know. And this is something you hammer on all the time, and something I try to get people to understand in our mentoring is like. It doesn't matter what license you have or the, like you said at the beginning that we, you have exactly level two um, because that's just like the entrance fee. But at, at the end of the day, people are going to judge you based on your work product. And and then I already can hear the new people screaming, but nobody will give me a chance, Chris. No one will give me a chance. <laughs> and and the, right. so they don't even know what my work product is. Okay. So until new adjuster listening, until you get your first storm, to show what your work product is. These people you're hiring to go find you work, these IA firms who are giving all the work to the Matt Allens of the world right now, um, they're they're selling for him right now, right? Um, your resume and what training you've received in the networking that you do is the features of your product you're trying to get them to sell. So if you have 
nothing on your resume but an Xactimate certification and a license. That that's better than nothing, but that's not a lot of features to go sell Liberty Mutual on you or to go sell Pilot to to have those sales people go find you work. And so you really have to look at yourself as a product. And I think that's the hardest thing for people to wrap their head around. I'm not a product. I'm a person. You're a dang product that's being sold for services, right? Like we have to have features to us. And so if you have the feature of, hey, this guy's exactly certified. He's got an adjuster license in 12 states. Oh, look, he also is liability certified. He's auto damage certified. Man, we could sell that. Like, let's do this. So I, I just think if you're having trouble getting your traction, one, get more salespeople, go get on more firms. Two, get more licenses because that makes you eligible to get work in other places. And three, start adding to your features list as an adjuster. Put another tool in your tool belt, but think of it as a feature on the product you're trying to get the IE firms to sell um, because that's all you are, is a product that they want to go sell to their companies to say, hey, give us work because look at this guy and gal and hundreds of guys and gals we have but that'll raise you up on who they're selling um, the work to. So I just think it's a shift in mindset we got to focus on. But that's why you worked for For so many months was you had the good work product, but I just hear everybody screaming, no one will give me that shot, Matt. And I'm like, well, (laughs) got to look at it differently until you get your first shot. Yeah, exactly. So, and, and not to put too fine a point on it, but it's having increasing that feature set for yourself, uh, increases your chances for getting that first deployment where you can get that chance to prove yourself because all that stuff before, like all the certifications and the licenses and everything, those are useful afterwards, but your first deployment, that's your, that's the big, your big chance to make an impression. And you're going to make an impression if you're able to close claims the first week, especially on cat property, if you're in, in the, you, the, your manager's phone's not ringing, with, you know, insureds or contractors or agents, whatever to chew in their ear off. Uh, they're going to, that guy's going to remember you that, that, that team manager, that team lead, they're going to say, oh, I right, remember you and you're going to make an impression good or bad. I've had people good contact me from yeah. this winter storm and say, I don't think they like me very much, Chris. I'm like, what, what, why you say that? Well, I was cut after one week and I was like, really? Well, did you know what you're doing before you went? And they're like, well, First time I'd really seen Xactimate was when I got there. And I'm like, well, no wonder. Like, I couldn't even get a claim right. closed in my first week or two. And it's like, yeah, he's going to remember you. So you better go change your features up after that. And the thing about it is, is that so because the IA firms, because they, they, they work so hard to develop those relationships and get those contracts with those carriers, they want to be able to say to the carrier, we have – 100 of 100 adjusters or 200 adjusters who are licensed in New York, right? Even if New York doesn't get cats very often, because New York is a highly populated state. And when they do get a cat, it's all hands on deck, everybody's going to New York, right? Um, so that if, if you have a New York license, that's a, a major feature, right? If you have but also exactly- desk adjusting. Oh, yeah, well, New not York. only that, because there's stuff coming in for liability claims, which are just auto claims deciding who is at fault, right? So there's yeah. tons of liability claims in New York every day, and they don't have anybody to handle those. All of a sudden, you show up with that feature set, boom, plug them in. We can get them to work tomorrow. And that's what I hear over for and over. Sure. I know you get the same thing. We need people in New York, New Mexico, Pennsylvania, auto damage, and Hawaii. And I'm like, who lives in Hawaii? I mean, they're not going to come work for you anyway. <laughs> come to Dallas from Hawaii. No, thanks. Sorry. I took you off your track, but I, I just, yeah, you know. No, no, it, you're absolutely right. You're saying. Yeah. Because it, it just is it, huge that way. It really is. It really is. So it makes, it makes you more marketable to the firm and it makes the firm more marketable to their client, which is the, the carrier. Right. And they, so when you, when you're able to, 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 survive that first cat deployment, we'll just say, and you got all your claims closed in a reasonable amount of time. You were closing claims the first week, which is huge. They're going to notice that, that, per, that, that team manager that at the end of that whole thing, they're going to r- look at everybody's list and they're going to have a big meeting and say, all right, well, who are we going to, who, who survived, who did well on this? They're looking at all the new people and they're going to see your name as somebody who survived, you did well, you got all your claims closed. You, you did corrections without complaint. 
Um, you were easy to work with. You're easy what? to get a hold of. You don't have free. to complain. You don't have to complain <laughs> and you have to answer your phone. Man, what? exactly. <laughs> so they will, they're going to say, all right, this is somebody that we can cultivate and, and bring them into our roster. And we're going to try to keep them busy because we don't want to lose them to somebody else. Right? Absolutely. I was going to say that. I was like, I hope you, that they are so competitive between the firms, even if it's a friendly oh competition, gosh. you know, they do not want yeah. to lose Matt Allen or, or, or uh, James Mathis to somebody else. If they're happy with them, they just don't, they, they want to keep them because that's their secret weapon now that they don't have to compete and call 50 people to find one person with a New York license. Who's no, that's our guy. Let's keep them working. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And it's, it's, uh, it's how careers are started. And, you know, the more they, they learn, they, they get to know you, they like you and they trust you, the more they're going to use you period. Right. So it's like, it's like, uh, you know, if you have to have work done at your house and you, you're looking around trying to find a contractor, right. And you find a guy or a gal who's, who does a great job. They're friendly. They're easy to get, get in touch with. You get to know them a little bit. The next time you have another project at your house, you're calling that person. You're not calling 50 other contractors. They did a great job. They did it in a timely manner. They got it done before they said they were going to that kind of thing. I mean, it's hard to find mechanics. It's hard to good mechanics. It's hard to find good contractors. And I think it's hard to find good adjusters because a, a lot of people have some of the parts the pieces of the whole thing, but they don't have all like the, some of the critical ones, like that customer service piece, which extends to anybody in your workflow, right? Customer service, the, the firm is your customer, right? Because you're as a business, they're your customer. The carrier is your customer. Everybody's your customer. So you treat them all. You want them all to have KLT with you, all of them, because they go, they're going to want to use you. You're a known quantity now. They like you. They like people want to companies and people want to work with people that they like that they know and that they trust. So it's, it, and, it, and it builds on itself. It snowballs and, and you know, a, a year or two or three or 10 in, I mean, you find yourself as a general adjuster and you're traveling around the country or the world and you're looking at, you know, Michael Jordan's toilet overflowed in his house, right? And you're at Michael Jordan's house, right? In his estimate, right? That's, there's, it, there's so many different places to go in this, in this business. I mean, it's, it's a little bit mind boggling. It really is. And it's not a shrinking business, even though it seems like, well, you know, robots and AI and machine learning are, are taking our jobs away. They may take away some types of jobs, but it doesn't diminish the overall opportunities, even by a long shot. Well, in some cases, okay, so you look at it differently. Um, I had that uh, text from uh, one of the students today saying, is the shop going to be around in five years? Because he's really enjoying it. Um, and he's like, this is great. I got this many claims. And is this, but is this job going to be around in five years? I'm like, I can't say for sure. Yes, exactly what you're doing now is going to be around. But I can say that AI is sure could potentially replace everybody on the planet for all jobs. But what oh, we've yeah. seen even recently is a property claim now takes two people rather than one. So now you have a virtual nice. sys guy and and Hubbard's still doing the measurements and you have a desk writer. So it's actually more people being employed, just maybe not making as much money per claim. So, so yes, there will be some things that are disrupted, sure. But at the end of the day, computers are stupid. They're dumb and they need a human to make a decision and say, this is what you base your calculation on this is the house i want you to scan hover you know or whatever and sure there's things that are in a way jobs tasks redundancies but i think ultimately being an expert in your industry being a professional claims handler it's not going to matter if the field property goes away because there's going to be somebody having to say this claim is covered there's going to be somebody having to talk with that insurer as we've seen through tons of customer service surveys over the last two years, even during COVID, people want to talk to people. And I just don't yeah, think that's going to change sure. that much um, that we're going to see this go away magically just overnight. It's, it's going to be an evolving process, but you have to evolve with the industry. I think they said the same thing with digital photos, right, Matt? You were around then. When I switched to digital photos, it's all going away. Oh, yeah. oh my it's, gosh. When did we switch to a digital file? It's like the manager was like, you know, I, I this is this is where we're going. Everything is going to be. You just have to upload it into the, you know, blogosphere or whatever, you know. 
And she picked up a file and she said, but I can't hold the file in my hand. I can't look through it. I can't take my red pen and go over it. So, I mean, this is, you know, it was like the end of days or whatever. And I was like, I'm so, I can't wait <laughs> to be able to just go ding and then go on to the next one instead of having to like print out a bunch of copies and tape you know, the have photos a file to jacket. the paper. Yeah, totally. Uh-huh. So I don't know. I mean, you look at like, you look at like McDonald's, right? McDonald's is a big company. They have a lot of money and they, they uh-huh. could, let's think about it. They could automate with robots, uh, have one or two or three people working in, at there. One guy to like pour the buns and the frozen patties into one end of this giant machine. And then it just kicks out orders, right? It spits them out of the other end in a bag. They could do that. But the last time I was in a McDonald's, when McDonald's, when they had their, their, their dining rooms open, there's like 15 people behind the counter, right? There's three people, you know, taking orders and then the whole like cooking area. And then there's people running back and forth to the, they don't do it. You know, I don't want to go to a McDonald's and like just push some buttons on a screen and then have my food pop out on a tray in front of me. I mean, maybe that would be kind of cool, but like why don't they do that? Is it be- or something? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Computer. Blend it up in a smoothie. Max. Yeah, two Big Macs. Yeah, right. In a smoothie <laughs> format, so I feel healthy. Exactly. Exactly. Well, so I had this one uh, years and years and years ago. I was working in Minneapolis, and Minneapolis is a kind of a unique place to work um, because I, I think that they have because of some of their laws um, with regard to claims and policies, they're a matching state. So it's really, really easy to, 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 you know, if you have a little bit of damage to one side of a house to end up when it's all said and done, paying for all the siding all the way around on that whole house. Right. So a $2,500 claim can turn into a $47,000 claim just like that. So, Contractors, if if they have a hail storm, if if they see you know one three quarter inch hail on any report going in any part of Minneapolis, which I think I saw a report a couple a few days ago up there, they're piling in because it's a big city. There's a lot of houses, and they're gonna and the, the prices of like roofing material. So anyway, it's, everything's higher up there. So contractors are gonna be able to make more money. They're gonna be able to ship in you know materials and things like that from out of state, and you know, have a big profit margin. So it's very, very competitive. If you, if you go and work uh, hail or even wind in Minneapolis, every single claim you go on, you're going to have a different contractor and they're all going to be fighting tooth and nail and it's calling every single little tiny scratch or little piece of moss or whatever on the roof. That's, well, you can't say the storm didn't do that, you know, and it's because they're going to get the whole roof bought if you find one, one little small amount of damage, right? So it's an it's working in, in in a place like that is an exercise in um, self control, right? Um, and I, I'm going to tell you the story. It's not a very long story, but it, it's it's the story of the of the guy, the contractor that pushed my buttons the hardest. And there's there's a handful of these guys. But this guy was like the top dog. When I think about it, it makes it gets me it makes me irritated, right? I get like my little adrenaline rush. And this was like probably 15 years ago. Um, this roof Forgiveness, was old. Matt, it's a good trait. Forgiveness, I know, man. It's a good trait. We started the episode with it. Let, let's end your story. We're going to end with, with it. We're going to end with it. We'll end with me <laughs> forgiving this guy. So he started in immediately like disparaging me as an adjuster. We're standing in the front yard and he's calling me names. I'm like shaking his hand. He's like, you know, um, well, I can't remember exactly what he said. It was basically like, you know, if you, you don't look like you're, you're too young to know what you're doing, you know. So hopefully, you know, we'll 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 get this. He t- turns to the insured and basically says, you know, you know, we'll do this first inspection and then we'll get somebody out here who actually knows what they're doing. It's got some experience. I mean, just right off the bat, and that kept up the whole inspection, everything was damaged. And he would just like, I would say, well, I don't see you, you make circle on the roof. And I'm like, I don't see anything in your circle. And he would just like chuckle, like, this kid, what are you just some kind of idiot? And he's like F bombs and everything else, like, everything. And I'm almost like, I'm starting to get mad because the insured is standing there like, yeah, why aren't you saying that that's damage? I mean, you know, this guy, he, he was believing the contractor and I'm like, not saying a whole lot other than, well, no, 
And that's not really, I can't, I can't take a picture of nothing and turn it in and send and give you money for it. I just can't do it. <sighs> well, you know, and it's just on and on and on. Finally, finally, I, I snapped and was like, listen, you have no idea what you're talking about. You're a f- crook, this, that, and the other thing. It's the one time I've done this in my whole career. And it was m- a major mistake. I was like, this, we're done here. I just, I just, I marched down to my car and he's yelling at me. He's way up on the road. He's yelling. And it's like, Oh, ah, there he goes. Little man. I just like, uh, I was like, jumped in my car and just drove away as fast as I could. Probably left my ladder there. You know, it was, it was just, I couldn't believe that that guy thought that that was a winning sales technique. Right. And he was like, like just not backing down on it. Not like showing any signs that he was an actual human being, but that he was just a villain. He was a monster. <laughs> and I, I don't know if I can forgive him, Chris. I don't yep, know. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to say counsel Matt right here on the couch chair. Yeah. So let's let that one go. Yeah. Man. So I get calls from my manager and I, because he got calls from the agent and everybody else saying, you know, that, that I had like, I had denied the roof on purpose because I didn't like the contract. It was like, and it just spiraled out of control. I had developed a very, very, very good relationship with both the carrier and my firm. And so they were like, man, what the heck is this guy talking about? I was like, he was off. He's the worst contractor I've ever, I've ever met in my entire life. I don't know where he was coming from. He was the worst person in the world pretty much. So, but you have to, even in the face of that, even in the face of that, an adjuster has to keep their cool and take their photos. It's not saying things like keeping your mouth shut as much as possible. Um, making no, okay, well, I, I, I'm noting down what you've said. I'm taking, I take a picture of that. Okay, great. You know, we'll, we'll, uh, you don't have to sit there and make a decision on the spot with it. Take your pictures, do your test square. You know, you're probably gonna have a big F equals zero and whatever on it. So that they're going to see, well, you're not going to pay for it. And, uh, I always, you know, the, the thing that I used after that, cause I had, I have had contractors try that after that, but I didn't react that way. And it didn't get me in the way that that first guy did. I'll say, listen, you know, I'm not, I'm not seeing what I need to see here for, for, you know, hail damage. The guy's yelling or whatever. And I'm talking to the homeowner. I said, but, um, I'm going to, I'm going to take this to my management team and we're going to sit down and look at it. And, uh, and, uh, we'll get, we'll get another pair of eyes on it. Um, so I kind of give a, a small out. It's probably not the best thing to do, but for the sake of like a person's sanity, I guess. And then maybe giving the, the homeowner a little bit of a, a little bit of release in a different direction than on you, um, can help in the moment. Um, but that kind of thing, especially if, if you're cool with the contractor, the homeowners will usually call like the next day or later that afternoon or a day or two later and say, listen, man, I really apologize. That guy was such a jerk. I, you know, I, I'm really embarrassed that he was at the house and he does, we don't want to use him for whatever, and which, whatever you guys say, we well, you know was, is, uh, you know, which would trust you, right? If you're cool about it, if you're able to have forgiveness in your heart beforehand, you know, carry it with you, then you'll find that you're, uh, your customer service rating goes up. Those, those incidences of like, you know, making your, just like you're getting an eye twitch, you know, and, and being, having the adrenaline course through you, those, in, those, those, uh, incidents just drop if, if you go in with the right attitude. So that's my, uh, and that's my, my worst contractor story. And there was a guy that was threatened to, to punt two guys that threatened to take a swing at me, which were not nearly as bad as that one. <laughs> well, let's say it's done. Well, because of your forgiveness or need to forgive story, I'm going to change my one time story that I was planning on and, and share my own crazy story of when I had to forgive somebody. So first uh, hailstorm, cat storm ever been on. Um, so I'm going from daily auto claim straight to catastrophic hail auto i had no idea what i was doing my father-in-law was training me oh it's easy you can do it here you go you know hooked me up with a company and i'm out there and it's like the first or second night it felt like it was for sure the first week because we're only there like five days or whatever so it's within the first few nights um we're given all our uh carrier um 
which we call it a uh, uh, carrying shirts to wear on the cat line, right? Because you got to represent the insurance company, put them in the washing machine at the uh, hotel, go have dinner or whatever in the room, come back. All the clothes are gone. All the carrier shirts, all my kids' clothes. I think I, one of, we like I had a few clothes still in the room. Um, and we're like, what in the world? And you know, your plug's just boiling and you're like, surely someone right. just took it out, and put it on the top or, or took it to the lobby or something. We're calling the lobby. They get security. They're looking around. They it, we're like, it's, it's nowhere. Like what in the world's going on? Somebody took our clothes. Like you still think that it happened. It's in Nashville, by the right. way, area. And then get a call from um, the security guy. He's like, Hey, I think I found some of your clothes come down here. Maybe it's bottom of the steps or whatever. And he shows me and all the clothes are like being dropped. Like some of the kids clothes are there and whatever. Oh, I had just one kid at the time. So the kids clothes are there and it's heading through a trail of tall weeds. It's like a homeless guy ran off with the clothes and all the clothes smell the rubbing alcohol. So like all of a sudden I go from extremely, extremely mad and like so judgmental and what kind of person would do this to like crap. There are people in this world that have it way worse off than me and I'm going to let this thing go. But I always say, if you see a homeless guy in Nashville standing on the side of the road with the USAA shirt on, you know, Tell them I forgive them, <laughs> and we're moving on from there. So that's my right. one-time forgiveness story, Matt. That's funny. That's uh, yeah, it's true, man. Sometimes you got to have a little bit of a have some perspective on the world, you know. Um, yep. But that's and you know that's an interesting thing is also is that just as a side note for storm shirts, they will tell you to not donate them to Goodwill to like cut the logo off or whatever, because they don't want to have people impersonating adjusters. So right. finding a, getting a, finding a, a state farm shirt at Goodwill and then wearing that and, and pretending like they're an adjuster or whatever. Yeah. So if people want to find out more about Chris Stanley and what an IAPath, what are they, where can they go? The simplest way is to head over to IAPath.com and click the how to find work button. You click that button, you're going to be enrolled in a free course that teaches you all the things we kind of were talking about today, but in a very succinct and, and systematic order, a roadmap of how to get your first or your next uh, storm deployment or daily claims, just how to get work in this industry. And it's a video course that just comes in your email every day. So uh, at the end of like 10 days, you're gonna know exactly what I think you could do to get work. Well, thanks a lot for being here, Chris. I really appreciate it. And uh, we'll catch up with you on the next one. All right. Sounds good. If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.